Welcome to the Korea Society and the Samsung Conference Center. We're delighted to have you here today. And this is the conclusion of a series called The Analyst. And we're very del delighted to have John Park. Uh, I will get to his introduction in just a moment after uh, just a few words of thanks. Um, we have been very grateful to uh, enjoy the ceramics of Lee Snyder, who is our board member in the audience here. Uh, today is the last day to see the exhibition of the Lee Snyder collection in our gallery, and we'd strongly encourage you to do so. We'd also like to invite those of you who are not members to please consider doing so at koreasociety.org. Uh, and for all of those listening on audio podcast or viewing online through the YouTube channel, welcome as well. And we do stream live during many of our programs, today's included. We'd like to welcome John to the stage. Uh, John Park is... Uh, many people say a rising star. Uh, he's actually a star uh, that has very much risen and attracts a tremendous amount of attention in uh, the Korean studies area uh, because of his keen intellect uh, and wonderful presentation, which you'll enjoy today. Uh, John really is one of the very, very best, and so we're delighted to conclude the series, The Analyst, uh, with his observations. Uh, John has worked extensively not only on the North Korea uh, China relationship, which we'll discuss primarily today, but also the issue we addressed last Friday of sanctions. And perhaps toward the end of our discussion, we'll chat a bit about his upcoming uh, two years of research on sanctions issues. Uh, John is fascinating uh, for his work on going now at Harvard uh, and the Belfer Center. He is teaching alongside Ambassador Stephen Bosworth, who will be with us on December 5th as part of our legacy series here. Uh, two more Fridays from now. And uh, John is uh, a researcher uh, of extraordinary talent uh, working out of MIT. Uh, he was an MIT uh, junior faculty fellow last year uh, as well. John has the interesting distinction in our field of not only having a very strong academic and research orientation, but he worked with the US, of Institute, uh, US Institute of Peace, and he worked prior to that with Goldman Sachs and with Boston Consulting Group. So he comes at these issues with a tremendous amount of skill from public service, academe, private sector, uh, NGO nonprofits, and he has a unique uh, set of views, I think, as a result of that. And his ability to digest and convey is quite remarkable. So John, welcome. Thank you. By way of introduction, we really appreciate your coming back to the Korea Society. Uh, we had a lot of great response uh, when people found out that you were coming back to join us. Um, it's been a year and a half or two, I think, since we've really talked about China-Korea. And in that time, uh, we had uh, two uh, uh, very high-level summits between Park geun and uh, Xi Jinping, I think, if you count other regional meetings, they probably had uh, half a dozen or so meetings by now. Certainly the meeting this summer drew a lot of attention uh, by way of the uh, visit of Xi Jinping to Seoul, especially uh, bypassing Pyongyang, uh, which some suggested uh, might be a new approach, and we'll get to that. Um, before we get into the wealth of, of China and North Korea and the relationship, I did want to give you an opportunity to, to speak really to the media issues of the week uh, and what has been this historic vote on human rights, uh, 111 to 19, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of condemning North Korea in light of the uh, Commission of Inquiry report, uh, how it may roll ahead in terms of the Security Council and what people anticipate to be a Chinese veto, perhaps alongside Russia, and um, what we've seen in the paper the last day or two, which is North Korea's threat to conduct a fourth nuclear test in lieu of that. Thoughts on that particular headline sure. for those in the media who are with us here today and sure. interested policy observers? Sure. First off, thank you very much for having me here today. It's, uh, <clears throat> it's always a pleasure to be at the Chris Society. I, I think with uh, the points that you mentioned, uh, what's striking is the report that Judge Kirby put together. Uh, as a collection of anecdotes and testimonies, uh, there isn't anything new. Uh, the community knew about these allegations and these reports. But for Judge Kirby to actually go through the process of going through investigations and video recorded and written down testimonies, putting all of that into uh, a report with a light blue seal of the UN on top of it has created uh, something as a, a very firm foundation for all these other initiatives uh, that now are, are being built uh, incrementally, being stacked up, but uh, being done in a way that each layer uh, is forming another part of this structure. 
I think what we're seeing with the movement towards uh, getting this before the International Criminal Court, uh, there is anticipation that China would veto it if it gets to that stage. But uh, I think the actual attention that is being drawn to the report uh, is something that is remarkable. Uh, and that is something that is being noticed by many countries. Uh, North Korea's reaction to the report is something that has been quite stark and quite uh, and significant in the sense of how much they're going out of their way to refute uh, key moments and key parts of, of the uh, report itself. But in a nutshell, I think what we're seeing is a game changer. This is something mm. that will gain uh, greater momentum, uh, and it's largely because of this report that Judge Kirby uh, put together. Mm. Is it enough of a game changer that China could abstain in the Security Council as opposed to veto? I think in a way for uh, China to abstain or veto it, uh, it's received a level of attention that this issue of North Korean human rights has not received in the past. So I think the uh, movement in many respects that is gaining speed is the game changer. And so irrespective of China abstaining from a vote or vetoing it, uh, in a way I think vetoing uh, this movement would actually give it another layer of legitimacy. So this is a very remarkable trend that if we track it going forward, uh, I think we're going to see uh, more of an involvement in terms of other countries that necessarily haven't been uh, you know, front and center and directly related to this issue. Mm -hmm. the, the title of, of our talk today, Rifts and, and Bonds and Binds as well, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of China-North Korea relations, suggests that uh, while there may be uh, a relationship, and you tell us, in terms of historical uh, friendship and cooperation, uh, perhaps there's been some suggestion that we're moving to a different day where the Xi Jinping administration has less tolerance uh, for North Korea, particularly when it comes to nuclear tests. Uh, and uh, perhaps in this human rights area too, having expressed uh, quietly some level of dismay. Um, where do you see the balance in terms of where North Korea and China have been and, and where they're going? I, I dial it back and look at the principles uh, in terms of how China, particularly the Communist Party of China, has formulated not only its North Korea policy, but more broadly, its Korean Peninsular strategy. Uh, if you look at it through that lens, the uh, primary principle is the non-intervention in the internal affairs of other countries. Uh, and so with that, you're looking at a situation where China sees chronic instability on the Korean Peninsula uh, and uh, an effort to build relations with both uh, South Korea and North Korea. Uh, I think the sentiment in Beijing is that the pillar that represents the relationship between China and South Korea is strong and becoming even more vibrant, but the uh, pillar between uh, China and North Korea still remains quite feeble. And so from a structural perspective, they need to do more in shoring up the stability of the North. And that's something that has, I think, been interpreted as perhaps a resurgence, uh, rejuvenation of their alliance. Uh, but from a Chinese perspective, it seems anything but. It's almost this notion that North Korea as this big instability variable presents perhaps the biggest challenge for the, the Chinese in the sense that whereas they've been able to enjoy greater flexibility or greater capabilities in other issue areas associated to its rise, uh, as it relates to North Korea, North Korea remains a problem that is a big headache, mm. a source of great deal of frustration, a source of great deal of anger as well. Uh, but with respect to this balanced Korean Peninsular strategy, uh, shoring up the stability of North Korea has led to I think one un unintended consequence, which is the prioritization of the party-to-party -party relationship, the Communist Party of China to Workers' Party of Korea relationship as a means to shore up in an institutional sense the stability of North Korea. But in doing that, the two-party has uh, really grown in prominence and overshadowed the six-party. Uh, so if you view it from North Korea's perspective, they're receiving a tremendous amount of support and benefit because of this Chinese obsession with stability that I think uh, unintentionally de-emphasizes the need for denuclearization, although that still remains very, very important for China. Mm -hmm. As you're sitting in a strategic planning chair in Beijing, are you looking at North Korea and saying, historic relationship, benefits of a card to play with the Americans? Uh, are you saying unwieldy, especially with this third generation? Uh, with the doing away of Zhang Song Tech, who was a principal intermediary, uh, which may or may not have had something to do with commercial ties and, and money transfers. Uh, are you saying that relative to the rest of my problems of, of dealing with the Northwest or Tibet or 
Taiwan or other issues that I certainly don't want an unstable Korean peninsula, uh, that there's a certain amount of leverage perhaps with South Korea relative to North Korea. How do you see the alignment in the view of the Chinese strategic planner? Sure. I, as uh, you know, has been conveyed to me and explained to me, this notion of the configuration of forces in these areas that you mentioned, I think, I think the Chinese strategic planners feel that they have more tools to apply to these very big challenges for them. And they feel more confident that the balance is, is turning into their favor on these issues. But with North Korea, that is still the issue area that they're always playing catch up, mm. uh, that the North Koreans have figured out ways to leverage certain opportunities uh, that present some big challenges that these other tools are not as effective in dealing with North Korea. Uh, one of the things to, to turn to your point about Chang Song Tech, uh, it's still early days, but I think one thing that can be attributed to him as a legacy is an interesting phenomenon of the emigration of the 1% into China. Mm. And this is a function of North Korean elites who are managers in state trading companies, uh, large ones that are affiliated to the elites uh, within the power structure in Pyongyang, uh, who are settling down in, in China. So you're looking at uh, families with their children going to the local you know, international schools. Uh, there, there seems to be more of uh, permanency to this in the sense that it's not just a uh, two-year posting, something along the lines of a diplomatic uh, time cycle. Uh, and that seemed to be one of the aspects of Chang Song Tech building up his patron systems and these channels of doing business between China and North Korea. So one of the things that uh, I think is still under-examined is this notion that as much as the focus remains on developments inside of North Korea, things along the lines of the development of its mineral resource sector, science for economic reform, uh, dramatic improvement in living standards in Pyongyang, uh, very open signs of conspicuous consumption, uh, luxury items, things like that. The other piece of it in terms of the North Korean 1% uh, emigrating, uh, and this isn't a large flow, but I think a significant flow to China uh, represents uh, something that is very different qualitatively from the past, but a large part of it dealing with Chang Song Tech and the type of business empire that he was building. Hmm. Do, does that mean then with the removal of Chang Song Tech from the scene that there's a compromise of that, or is it just a matter of, of a shift among elites with the purges and the consolidation? The purging apparently is still going on. You see snippets of the reports coming out that this individual or this family member of someone who's close to uh, Chang is, is uh, either being detained or, or some notion that they had been purged. Uh, but in terms of the operation of the patron system, uh, this is vital. It's almost like oxygen for the Kim Jong-un uh, regime. And so uh, certainly doing away with the lieutenants of Chang Song Tech uh, is an important priority. Uh, I think this constitutes the first major crisis for uh, Kim Jong-un uh, leadership structure in the sense that if you go under the criteria of political necessity of getting rid of the Chang Song Tech uh, network and, and all those who are close to him, uh, if he does that well and gives himself an A+, plus, in the other area of generating revenue for the regime, uh, you essentially get a failing grade. And so the, the balance there of certainly purging certain members but rehabilitating others and making sure that this patron system continues is a priority. I think one of the reasons why this type of immigration will continue. But the uh, interesting thing about this composition is that there's a certain tacit knowledge in terms of making money and lear learning how to do business with Chinese partners. Those individuals at not necessarily the upper elite levels, but senior manager, the actual uh, people who are, are tasked with uh, structuring these transactions and seeing them to fruition. Uh, training individuals and trying to replace these type of individuals is extremely difficult. So I think in a way that is something that is secure for those individuals. Uh, they all have some kind of connection with Chang Song Tech, but the more senior elements seem to fall under the category of political threat. They seem to have been dealt with. But the senior managers and those who are the worker bees for these type of operations uh, they constitute, I think, interesting elements of the 1% who are, again, sinking roots inside of China. Hmm. What about the loyalties of the 1%? I, I would imagine those of us in the studio audience or listening or watching online are, are probably a bit shocked to think of diaspora as a word associated with right. North Korea. Right. And, and where are the loyalties? Uh, are they to the state? Or are they to the self, to the, to the bank account? It seems, I think one way to look at it is uh, divided loyalties mm -hmm. in the sense that you have uh, individuals who are very successful in these areas of making money, 
doing business, uh, having a certain type of track record, and as a result, being valued by the regime, uh, who are uh, essentially looking at the future and uh, viewing it as uh, an arena where it's increasingly competitive. Uh, it's amazingly, uh, you know, through defector interviews with defectors used to work in North Korean state trading companies, there's a great deal of focus on the next generation, this view that I have to prepare my children for this new reality, which is international competition. Uh, so certainly there are other important considerations, but a big one is the education of their children so mm -hmm. that they have the opportunities that the princelings or the children of princelings uh, have this uh, type of training and pedigree and exposure so that they too can be uh, effective and successful. Uh, so that element, I think, is a, a loyalty f focused on the next generation of the family. Loyalty to the regime gives the opportunities to have these type of uh, postings abroad where uh, more of a longer term posting, I should say. But the remarkable thing in all this is that if you take a step back and look at this trend, an early trend that seems to be growing, there's de facto decentralization of the North Korean regime. You're having key elements of the regime going abroad to make money for very strategic purposes. And as a side benefit, they also are enjoying these types of benefits. Uh, so you have to look at it, I think, as uh, one of the big transformations that's happening, uh, not inside of Pyongyang directly, but through this emigration. Hmm. Fa fascinating. The first speaker in our series was uh, Nicholas Eberstadt from AEI. Uh, and he talks uh, and writes about a, almost a dependencia effect, the idea of uh, North, Co North Korea, you know, perhaps rattling the saber at times more recently with China as a result of actually increased dependency on China. Um, do you feel that there is that sort of potential for client state development, or, or is that a bit much? There seems to be a, a uniform sentiment that <clears throat> excuse me, there is uh, too much of a reliance on China. Hmm. And this need to diversify seems to be a priority. Uh, having said that, th these are still early days, but it's quite striking that uh, Kim Jong-un sends uh, you know, his personal emissary to meet with Putin mm -hmm. in Moscow to try to get something going again in the North Korea-Russia connection. Uh, what's interesting, recent developments, uh, Moscow has forgiven uh, something like 90% of the Soviet-era debt Mm -hmm. uh, and the remainder is supposed to be contributed to joint economic development projects mm -hmm. that are of mutual benefit to North Korea and, and uh, Russia. The other recent development is that the uh, Russian authorities announced that transactions that North Korean uh, entities do in Russia can be settled in rubles. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there are some shades of, of how these transactions are going down in China in the sense that you're essentially seeing the North Korean entities piggyback off of the financial economic infrastructure, transportation infrastructure. Uh, if that's one of the trend lines on the, on the Russian side as well, uh, it certainly isn't at the level of China, but the opportunities can be significant ones. Uh, so the, the notion of uh, these type of relationships with the Chinese, as much as there is this deep mistrust on the Chinese side of the North Koreans, it goes the other way around as well. Uh, so the, the complexity of the situation is such that you almost see the necessity of certain arrangements uh, as opposed to the preference of arrangements. But certainly these coping mechanisms have been very effective for the North Korean regime in the short term. Mm. I, I put the, a question yesterday in, in uh, uh, luncheon with a Russian reporter uh, of you know, whether this is something new from, from his perspective. He was quick to say, well, one, North Koreans have mastered playing Moscow and Beijing off one another for many decades, and that from a Russian perspective, some might see it in that regard. Secondly, he said the behavior is the same. Uh, things like debt forgiveness don't bring that issue up very much sensitive to North Koreans, and they figure or feel that that should be forgiven mm -hmm. and, and put aside. But he said it's basically a, a, a sort of a user mentality or behavior, uh, to paraphrase. Um, and so, you know, I was pressing this point of, aren't they really diversifying? Mm -hmm. and, and he was a tad more doubtful about that. But how do you see the play relative to Russia? And of course, none of these things are in a vacuum. Russia and China itself have, sure. you know, an enormous exactly. amount of new developments as we've just seen recently with the uh, APEC meeting in Beijing and, right. and Xi Jinping alongside Vladimir Putin. Uh, there's also perhaps the effect of the 
post-Ukraine realities for Russia as it looks to Asia as something of a counterbalance. And right. North Korean propaganda department has been very much playing the Ukraine crisis from the Russian perspective. And then how would something like Russia's overtures to Japan be viewed in this diversification context? Well, I think uh, what you mentioned earlier is, is quite valid. Uh, there are remarkable events uh, taking place between China and Russia. Uh, so a $400 billion energy deal over 10 years. Uh, this notion that there are early signs of arms uh, deals that will be uh, negotiated further, uh, something that the Russians were hesitant to do, concerned that the technology uh, would be re reverse engineered by the Chinese and then sold uh, and used uh, along those lines. But the necessity of certain deals and activities, largely because I think repercussions of what happened in Ukraine, uh, have created opportunities for China. So from a Chinese perspective, doing these deals with the Russians is almost like buying you know, stock really cheap with the, the knowledge that some of these uh, goods and terms will be beneficial in the longer term. And I think that creates space for the, the uh, North Koreans. You know, certainly on their, on their own, they couldn't have created these type of openings. But as they, they uh, take place, uh, I think you're seeing uh, quite a flurry of North Korean activity with this narrow area. Uh, I think the, the doubts related to how far North Korea will go in these various areas are very healthy doubts. You know, there's a track record of largely announced uh, initiatives with big fanfare amounting to very little. Uh, but if you tie it to these larger trends and this space that's opening up to the North Koreans, uh, I think there is something by way of uh, foothold that is growing. Uh, it's at a small stage right now, but there are pilot projects to bring in coal through uh, different ports in North Korea to South Korea. Uh, and already the coal trade has been a big source of revenue for the North Korean regime. This is coal that is sold to China. And there are reports that there are some companies in China that turn around and sell that coal to South Korea and Japan uh, and label it as uh, China uh, origin coal. So the, the notion that you have this type of activity happening below the surface at pretty significant rates, I think uh, shows that the, there are different movements that uh, present this idea of this foothold that, that is growing. Mm. One of the other stories of the week is uh, that of the detention of Korean-American missionary uh, uh, on the Chinese-North Korean border, uh, this coming three months after uh, detention of a Canadian couple as well. Uh, it appears that China is cracking down on some of the missionary activity. How do you put that in the context of what's happening with these developments in China-North Korea relations? It, uh, it's something that uh, you know, certainly has received the highest level of attention. Uh, so from senior levels of the Canadian government trying to secure the release of these two Canadians, uh, this is something that uh, has definitely been in the headlines. Um, but uh, I think from a Chinese perspective, this is a, a function of law enforcement, of national security. Uh, the charges against these individuals uh, have a lot to do with the Chinese formulation of national security in this sense that it had been violated in some way. I think for other counterparties, there, there is now the premium in terms of wanting evidence to, to verify something like this. Uh, but the gravity of the situation is such that uh, I think there, there is a great deal of sensitivity in terms of how things are observed in the border region. Uh, there are human rights aspects, uh, but there is also uh, a number of other trends that uh, I don't see any direct evidence of connection. But uh, in terms of uh, the complexity of, uh, of issues that are happening simultaneously, there's also a narcotics problem in the border region as well. So when you view it from the perspective of the Chinese and trying to deal with a very troublesome zone and a very troublesome area, uh, I think the sensitivity aspect will... Uh, translate into certain types of actions that may err on being very cautious, which uh, leads to these types of detentions. But uh, I think the good thing is that it is receiving international attention, and hopefully that kind of scrutiny will lead to positive outcomes. Mm. Dr. John Park, thank you very much. Round of applause thank for you. John. Thank you. We wanted to extend a special invitation to the audience today as well on Monday the Assan Institute uh, will be here to release a follow-on report to the UN Commission of Inquiry report. And they will be talking about uh, an issue that was raised in John's presentation about foreign labor, North Korean labor abroad, as well as issues of slavery. And there will be some insights from some very noted uh, discussants about the vote this week. 
So those of you interested in that, please do come back and see us at noon on Monday. Uh, this concludes our series, The Analyst. And uh, John, thank you, thank you. Uh, for doing this. We really appreciate your time, and we look forward to having you back. I did mention John was co-teaching this term with uh, the great Ambassador Stephen Bosworth, and please do join us on December 5th for Ambassador Bosworth here in conversation and his reflections on his contribution to Korea-U.S. relations. So, John, thank you so much for coming, and we really appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you all for your time today.